model is making its rounds. Oops, somebody was good at that. Oh, Steve must have popped in. Thanks, Steve. Not good at the little details sometimes. Thank you. So, um, and I, my passion is really going into Education 3.0. And that's where I'm going to spend a little bit of time. There's a little bit about me. I love being on social networks, and I also hate doing one-way communication. So you're, I encourage you, and I'm going to ask you questions throughout the, the presentation so that you can become involved. But you're more than welcome to – I watch the chat. I teach online, so I'm used to doing the, to interacting via the chat. So I'd love for you to just – I call it call and respond. even when I'm with my students in face-to-face -face or conference, I love when people yell stuff out and create that, some of that interaction. Because as it stands now, this, this modality of me just talking to you is Education 1.0. And as you'll see, I'm not very fond of it. So please feel free to interact at any point. So that's a little bit about me. So what I start off with, and I like to start off with all of them, is this idea of core beliefs on what I think is good teaching and learning. And I come from a non-traditional route, which is outdoor experiential education, because I was one of those kids, K through 12, who thought I was going to die of boredom in my public education. So I wanted to become an educator so that no other kids could die, have to die of boredom in their education. So I like to start off with my core beliefs. And as you'll see, they'll um, hopefully lead into my ideas of Education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, which relates to pedagogy, andragogy, heterogogy, which then I've connected to the SAMR model of how we should be incorporating technology. But again, as I said, because we're interactive, I actually made a little game. And if as I talk you want to go play the game, I made little cards out of my core concept. And that if you want to play this game on another window while I'm talking, feel free to. Oh, by the way, I do have these on, and they tweeted them out. Thank you. Um, uh, I have all the slides on, on slide deck. So you will get on SlideShare, so you'll get a copy of all of them, as well as the links. So we okay for now? I always keep checking in to see if you all are there. I'm not good at talking to air. Thanks, Dave. Somebody might be playing the game, which is fine, too. <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. All right. So I go over these pretty quickly just so that, um, again, you have a foundation of what I'm thinking about. And then how do we learn? I so don't believe that being taught that. Even I love TED Talks. People know I do, but I don't really grow or learn or change because I listen to a good lecture. I enjoy it, but I don't think that makes for good learning. And so that active participation, like some of you might be participating in a game, might help you learn these concepts a little better. So what I do is I list it again. There's just a few of these just to provide you with a foundation. And in the slide deck itself, you'll see links as part of my course concepts that lead to articles that discuss those core concepts um, a little more. Education should be learned by doing. Have any of you heard of Ray Kurzweil? Yeah, he's pretty cool. I think it's just you and me, Dave, huh? Um, thank you for responding. That's OK. Oh, that's cool. I took a little less time, but more flipped. So. <laughs> so yeah, so Ray Kurzweil, I actually tweeted this out. He's a futurist, and he doesn't even, he's not even an educator, and he has this idea of learn by doing, and um, <laughs> you get better with time. Um, and I just, I don't, and it's been coming up a lot with the maker movement. That's my other passion right now is this idea of we have to actually interact with our learning materials to be able to really get it and understand it. Another concept I'm driven by is that learning should be engaging, authentic, and relevant. What's really interesting is I started off as an educator a couple decades ago, and we're still talking about engaging, authentic, and relevant. And I'm sorry, I know very few worksheets that are engaging, authentic, or relevant. I actually have a friend, Alice Keeler, who actually bought a domain called Worksheets Suck. 
because I think we that's part of the board and we ask students to do things that have no relevancy in their life. And again, I encourage you to make your own comments as I'm talking or um, let me know what you think as we go through this. You could say, I disagree. You could say, I agree. You could say, yes, this happened to me. So you're welcome to, to kind of make comments. I do like that channel. Another con concept, and I, how many of you have heard of, uh, I can never say his name, so I'm not even going to try the state of flow. Producing this idea of state of flow, are you all familiar with? Check, check. Oh, you're not. Oh, you'll enjoy this day. He rocks. He did a study on how, think about times that you are so into what you're doing that time stops, that you're so, that nothing else exists except for that. For me, it's like when I prepare this, I always re-prepare my slideshows. I spent six hours on it yesterday because I like doing it. I do pottery. So this idea of you're so engaged in what you're doing that nothing else matters. So again, when you get this, um, oh, actually, I'm going to talk about that, Maureen. There was a, you don't, I call it Education 1.0. I'm actually going to have you look at this thing showed, um, shared by Edudemic yesterday, and that they have these lists of apps, and I couldn't believe. We're going to see, you're going to tell me what, if it's Education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. I call them worksheets on steroids. Another concept is it should be um, social and emotional and intellectual, and it should engage. Uh, it's, ASCD has whole person learning, which I agree with. And then I think we miss this a lot. Really giving time to have learners, and I do it as an educator, I'll do it even after this presentation, reflecting on how well it went, what did I learn, what are my takeaways, and, um, yep. Do they do um, IB schools? Or actually, I have some students with them, yeah. I have a couple of my grad students from Boise State, and they have, they have some really cool curriculum. I have one student who's doing I, um, IB biology, and they, they do a lot of cross-curricular things, too, um, in terms of they're doing writing across the curriculum, and her, her projects are excellent, so I'm pretty impressed. And then my biggest one, and this is a really cool article. Again, you'll get the slide share that has the links to all these by Grant Wiggins. Everything you know about curriculum may be wrong. We forgot somewhere along the line that curriculum's not about knowledge dissemination or content learning. It's about does it change behavior and thinking. And <laughs> um, and I even say with you all spending an hour with me, if I don't have, even, if you leave without wanting to know more, trying something different, thinking about some of the things I present a little differently than when you came in, I failed you. I don't want to waste people's time. So even if you're here for an hour, you have devoted your time to come to the presentation. So I, I my contract to you is that you leave with something that's meaningful, that'll change, that change how you think about things, do things. So um, I do that even when I'm working with kids. I work with gifted kids. I'm trying to get a job again with them. And every day I say, you never know if they're going to come back the next day for whatever reason, that we should be working to, that there's something different about them when they leave. Well, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, I just put it together yesterday. And if you know about um, the gaming world right now, I, this is a, these were actually a couple of my undergrads in a communication class. They actually, someone made a game, and this is them winning, so I got them. I call it, we should be jumping up and down. I want my kids, and they do often in my gifted classes, to say, is it time to go yet? Or this is really cool? Or can I stay in for recess? Those are epic wins. And I don't think there's enough of that, that, that learning should be exciting and engaging. So all this leads to, oh, I, I would do this if we have a longer, but you might want to look at it at some point. It's pretty cool. I have people go and um, in my face-to-face -face workshops and upload a picture of an epic win. 
of an epic learning experience. We've had them, and a lot of them don't occur in schools, which is a shame. And this is me. I used to, um, I'm there by the, I'm out up front there. With, these were a group of delinquent kids, and I just, it was magical. This was a canoe trip to the Boundary Waters. But I'm not going to have us do that today. I just wanted to show you to think about basically if we're, the whole, for me, it all ties together. Education 2.0, 3.0, um, pedagogy, and then the SAMR model. How do we create epic wins for our students, epic learning experience for our students all the time? I mean, a lot. Not just, let's do genius hour for 20, for tw hi, I can't, I don't know, I, Carmen, um, thanks for joining us. I want, I want my students to have engaging learning experiences a good percentage of the time, and that's just not the case, and it breaks my heart. So this idea, again, I started looking into this probably about a year and a year and a half ago. How do we move from an education 1.0 to 3.0? And you could look at some of the characteristics there. I'll give you a second to look at it. If there's anything that stands out for you that you go, yes, that's so, that so resonates with me, or feel free to put it in the chat. Oops, I clicked on it, but I didn't mean to. I was just grabbing a cup of tea there. And then the connected one is moving from pedagogy to heterogogy. I love the term heterogogy. Just learned about it in a class I was teaching that was already, how many of you have heard of heterogogy? <laughs> okay. Oh, good, Lucy. That's nice to hear. We're actually um, doing a book. It's supposed to be out in September, and it's going to be an e-book. And there's probably about 12 of us that are submitting chapters, and it'll be sold on Amazon, and then this, uh, the proceeds are going to a school in Africa, so the whole thing works um, works for me in terms of how that's going. It's really, it's beyond andragogy, so it's pretty cool. But I'll talk some more about that in, in a few minutes. So education 1.0 tends to be the, our um, go-to. Good for you, Maureen. I love you teaching the kids um, the process of learning, too. I hope you talked about it with them. But I call, I, I, I've entitled a lot of these um, the three, and these are the three R's, and not the way I look at them or most people. They're receiving, responding, and regurgitating, where students become their receptacles of knowledge. And it's a, it's a very, very much a one-way communication. So like I said, even though I'm trying to get some interaction here, this is not my favorite modality. I just do it. I do these because I love these concepts and want to spread the, the word and the and the ideas, but um, like Stephanie, um, but having but having me communicate to you this way is so counterintuitive and counterproductive. I've never been a lecturer, so again, I do this just because I want you to get excited about this content and spread it. Hi, Camille. So if you look at it, it is a one way. No social networks, use of textbooks, a lot of teachers talking at. And for me, I, I actually am amazed that if the older kids get, the less they interact with things. And I say probably starting in upper elementary on, for most kids, education occurs from their ears up, meaning they're told to listen and use their brains for most of the education and the rest of their bodies are ignored. And this goes with the concept of instructivism. Also, the idea, you probably heard of it, that kids are these blank shells and that you pour information in them and they're supposed to spit it out in a way that, that um, you want them to spit it out. They don't even get to spit it out in a way that they understand it. Hi, Linda. And then pedagogy.
Yeah. Well, for me, I only do my my um, lectures, so to speak, only come procedurally because I do a lot of hands-on makers. So, so my talking at the kids is usually to tell them some instructional piece of how to do rather than me just blabbing up about some content. Pedagogy in its purest form is the same thing as instructivism. You sit, you listen, you regurgitate back what the teacher said, almost parroting them. So in the chat, this one will probably be easy. Put, please put examples of when you felt you were instructed at or when, um, when you've been subjected to Education 1.0. For me, my favorite is memorizing the states and their <laughs> state and city capitals. It is. That's why people groan. I'm trying, that's why I'm trying to get, yeah, interact, Dave. <laughs> Copying definitions out of the textbook, yes. Yeah, I, I went to a Stephanie. I started at a school a couple of years ago, and you know the Wong book. What the heck is that? The Wong book about classroom management. They spent four days reading and having us read and learn passages from that book. And I've known that book for 20 years. That's probably why I forgot what it said. Yeah, that's it. I couldn't believe that. I'm like, uh, it was. I thought I. It's funny. We talked about flow earlier, and when we're subjected to these type of experiences, isn't it funny how time just slow? You look at. I remember instructors in college who'd get up and do um, three-hour lectures in their notes, and I thought I died and went to hell. I mean, it was like uh, I can't believe how slow time's going. And then you have us do something like go and create something or. Um, in biology class, in geology class, looking at minerals and testing for the pH balance, and that, that three hours got, went so fast. <laughs> Maureen. So there's Education 2.0, and it is a, it's about three other C's, communicating, connecting, and collaborating. Oh, that's a riot. It is, isn't it? It's a three, and, um, it's still people, it's a step in the right direction, but it's still the teacher as an orchestrator. And that's where, this really came home, and I have another post about this, but one of the kids, Zach, I forgot his last name, he's in the student voice, and he was on a panel, and I'll never forget this, he said, projects that give, that teachers give us are just like worksheets, they're just something else to get done. I think we can make it more engaging, project-based learning. That's what fits into here. I think it's exciting, and I think we can create rich experiences, but we still have to remember it's teacher-oriented. Oh, it's good for, I do it with my, uh, I use it with my uh, student teachers. It's really good for them. I do, I have student teachers, and it's, it's actually had some really good suggestions, but don't give it to veteran teachers and ask them. To hear lectures about it for four days. That was pretty amazing. So this is a little different. Andrew Goji fits into this idea. And where do you have some ideas? What are some examples where you've either been a student or a teacher of Education 2.0? Or Andrew Goji is a term that's used for adult learning, but um, a lot of the concepts fit with good projects and good interactive, um, using prior experiences, hands-on, uh, making sure it's relevant to the learner. Those are some of the characteristics of and andragogy. Would it be? Does the connectedness move, Dave, um, have assignments for you to do, even though they might be exciting? Maybe it's a, because I know some MOOCs are, they come in all flavors, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Yeah. 
That's what. That's why it's been. Um, yeah, I think that might go into education 3.0. Anybody else have any examples of education 2.0? So was that more, Stephanie, was that more um, education 2.0 or 3.0? Did they have assignments for you? That's really kind of the difference between 2.0 and 3.0. 2.0 is still a teacher orchestrated, meaning that the teacher is giving you assignments to do. I'm really good at education 2.0. And as you'll see, education 3.0 is very hard to do. I, I still try to do it in some points. So if you were given some assignments, and asked to, to do them by the teacher, then it's, and if they're engaging and relevant and, and they're cooperative learning, then it's, that's 2.0. That might be more 3.0 then. When we get into 3.0, let me know, Stephanie. And I don't know how you say your name. Payesh? Payesh? Could you say how the chemistry labs, could you put in the chat how they might have been Education 2.0? Was there an open-ended, so project-based learning, um, problem-based learning, inquiry learning? Those are all fit into Education 2.0. So there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a framework that you have to work within for 2.0. And I had a lot of fun with this diagram. And you know what, Maureen? That's a good question. You don't assess it. In education, if you look at this, I'll ask this in the chat. In education, Thanks, Stephanie. I, add, I do it on whiteboards and then I take pictures. Education 3.0, based on this drawing, who does the assessment? Yeah, that's part of it, too. It is. Somebody mentioned that somewhere. Learners are definitely curators. Learners, content producer, and share day fit, fit um, it are the beginnings of that curation process. So nobody, no. Yes. And who establishes the goals? So I'll give you an example, and I'll, I'll go find it and throw it in the chat. Yeah, a lot of times it depends on the age. I did a, a wiki with my gifted kids, and here it is. I'll actually give you one of the favorite pages on this, cooking. So this was done with fifth, fourth, third and fourth graders, so it can be done with younger kids. And what they were told is they needed to, they could pick a topic. They needed to, oh, here's the template. Let me get you the template. They could pick the topic. They need to come up with their own learning goals. They needed to, I'm not in the chat right now. I'm trying to get you, oh, here it is. They needed to find resources for other kids. They needed to assess the resources for, for using a um, template I had, and then they have to show what they learned. This is pretty close. Even though I had a framework, this is pretty close to 3.0 because the students were doing all the, all the work. And my thing is, a little aside, is that I believe if the teacher is doing more work during class time than the students, then that's a problem. 
it's the students that really should be doing most of the work. So what I would do is, while the kids in our computer time in the afternoon while they were working on their projects, and you'll see from that cooking project, we actually worked with the, with the class from the country of Turkey, that um, I would walk around and just give them ideas. I would introduce them to new web tools. I would help them troubleshoot, but they were directing their own learning. And they were able to do that in third, and third fourth, and fifth grade. And this is just, I love this diagram. Yeah, and that's what, that's what, what we're doing, um, the hard part, Maureen, is we're trying to break the paradigms that the kids and their parents have. It's the teacher that grades us. That's not my job, and it's, it's really working trying to establish a whole new paradigm. So this is a really fun, we were at a think, a think tank in Canada, and I just, um, Julia Forsyth did this, but we were talking about what happens too often is we think the curriculum is the whole territory and it's the map's not the territory. There's so much more to learn and that we really have to help students go up and create their own learning journeys. And that's what this all is all about. And you'll see when I get to the SAMR model, that's what we're missing out at. We still think we we still are under the uh, illusion that we can create the student's learning journey for them. So if you get anything out of being here today, I hope, and those who are still listening, I know people multitask at these things. That's what's really hard for me to present this way. Um, the one thing you get is even when we attempt for the students to go on the learning journeys we want them to go on, they're often going on their own anyhow. So this, this illusion of control, this illusion that they're learning the things we want them to learn is just an illusion. Think about how many things you quote, learned in your K-12 and maybe college education that isn't with you anymore. I was really good at math. I used that example, algebra and geometry. And I look at an algebra equation now, and I have no idea how it means. I was, like, top in my class, and I have no idea, looking at these equations, what they mean, how to work them, and that's a problem. So they try to take me on that learning so just that learning journey in Education 1.0. I went through the motions, and I have nothing to show for it. And that's, that's my whole reason for doing presentations like this. I'm reading that. Yeah, Montessori. I know some people, the guys from Google went to Montessori. We have some real rocking people that <laughs> came out of the Montessori movement. Isn't that interesting, huh? Yep, that's what I did, and that was the problem. And then I went into Second Life, which is a virtual world, and I was using, I was did a lot of building of virtual buildings and interactive, and boy, did I learn geometry concepts because they meant something to me. X, Y, Z, axes meant something to me, and, and learning how to rotate three-dimensional objects learned, meant something to me, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And that fits with heterogogy. And I could do a whole thing on heterogogy, but I still want to get to the SAMR model. So, and that's what I'm saying. If you read the, you, could, you know, I have some quotes here that you can look at later, but the ownership of the learning path and the process is up to the learner. And that's the bottom line. And this is just a cool list. I want. I just wanted to include it. I, I do like neuroscience and looking how the brain works. And here are just some principles that fit into the tenets of heterogogy. All right. Does anybody has anybody had the joyful experiences of of being in an education 3.0 or a heterogogical environment? Connectivism. That's what Dave was talking about earlier. Some of you mentioned a few that might fit better here. That really was somebody just saying, for me it would be, um, and I'd love to do it more. I do it a little bit more with maker education. I say, all right, build a robot. 
tell me what you want in the robot, what the prototype, what it's going to do, and I let the kids just go for it. Dave, I think that's huge. I talk about, I think what Dave says there is really um, big um, educators, and that goes back to the difference of what Stephanie said earlier about Education 1.0 for PD and Education 3.0. And I know Eric Schellinger out of New Jersey is doing a badging system so that his teachers, we have to sometimes show accountability so his teachers are learning and they're able to, to use badges to demonstrate their learning. But that's why I don't like MOOCs, because I live a MOOC. A lot of the connective of MOOCs is about getting on social networks and doing this stuff, and I do it, and I've seen you on Twitter, and I, I tweet, and I blog, and I come to conferences like this, and it is our own. It is definitely Education 3.0, and we're assessing it for ourselves. You know, I, I learn more about, like I said, the maker movement is big for me. I have a, right now, and I have a, a hashtag set up for it, and I, and I, I watch what's going on and I look at articles and I learn and I try out new ideas and I share new ideas and that's what it's about. And I'm going to add to that, Stephanie. For me, I also don't ask questions that could be Googled or have a an answer. I was just telling someone, my aunt's visiting, I said, if a student can find the answer online, then don't ask it really quickly. I'm reading some of the past chats. Well, that's cool, Maureen. Do you have a link for that? Choose your own venture. I'm reading back in the chat. Oh, yeah, there's way too many. All right, so I want you to watch this little clip and tell me what type of education is going on here. And I'm going to actually put it in the chat and in the um, web. And as you look at this, think about are these young people experiencing education 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0? And here, let me do it both in the web. And if it's not showing up, I'm also putting it in the chat, maybe. I get over there.
All right, that's a cool video, huh? So put your thoughts in there about why. There's not, and if I asked you, I would be a hypocrite if I said there's the answer to this. And part of that is, and this is just my own teaching, that I let go of expected outcomes, meaning I never, I give, so I'm a project-based learning teacher, meaning, again, I'm, I'm education 2.0 and try to dip into 3.0. And if you're expecting a certain response, then you, you are not in that 2.0 or 3.0. Because education 1.0 expects that response. I just want your ideas about which I like what they're doing in this video. I like um, the outdoor connection and the mobile learning connection. So I'm just interested in your ideas and some of you put in. Does anybody else have any ideas about um, what you saw in terms of education 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0 as they watch the video? I've learned to give wait time. What I do is I take a drink of soda and that gives people wait time. I see Camille's typing. I don't know if she's typing in the chat. So what it becomes to, now I'm going to connect I don't think so, especially the kids. I like um, giving, I actually like the idea of take a picture, take a video, um, write it. I like the idea of choice, especially if you know universal design for learning. If you don't, that's another thing I think um, all teachers should know about, that you offer multiple means of representation and expression. So some kids might want to draw the, the, the uh, things they saw outside. Another one might want to even act it out, take a picture. So I like that idea of choice. So that, that, that would make it move more towards 3.0. So if you look at this continuum here, you'll see that, um, that that's my goal anyhow. And I really like this idea from e-learning to mobile learning to you learning. And this next one's probably one of my favorite graphics. I didn't do this. But it's moving for education. Um, yeah, it really does, Linda. Thank you. If you have a link for folks for UDL, you could throw it in there because, I, again, if folks don't know about it. But I really like this. It really does represent moving from education 1.0 to 3.0, as well as moving from pedagogy or instructivism to heterogogy. Conformity matters, the trust matters, the whimsy matters. And I sure love when my students, I don't care if they're my third graders or my graduate students, I love their whimsy. And it really changes the whole learning atmosphere and environment when we allow the whimsy to come out. So this is a really great article from Fast. If you don't know Fast Exists Company, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, that's a really good. I, I always share this. It's a lot of cool tools on the one that Maureen just put in, the UDL tools. And that's um, the center. Yeah, I teach a class on UDL. I love it. But this is a really great article from Fast Company. And I, I actually, if we're living in this age of information and content and tool abundance, and we don't have to be misers anymore, and that we need to start reconceptually a new learning, a new type of learning. And again, I just included this because it's just another way to look at how we really need major educational reform. And this is a business sector from the FAST company. So now, this is basically what I've been saying. Access, information, creativity is qualitative differently than any time in the history of humankind. We are living in a, look at, we're sitting here from all over the place interacting. We have tools to create. We have Twitter where you can go tweet out. It's different. And so why aren't we using them in the classroom towards Education 3.0? And here's the, uh, here's the uh, firework, the major firework. We have this model that's being thrown around for technology integration called the, the, the SAMR, 
How many of you are familiar with this? Getting a lot of press this past year. Oh. <laughs> Who's that, Camille? You? That's cool. That's cool, Marine. Anybody else familiar? All right, then let's do a, just a quick video on it. Only two minutes. In 120 seconds, let me go grab the link for you. All right, yeah, that was just an overview. The examples they gave were the Google Docs. Yeah. But I have, I'll, sh I'll show you some additional ways. This is the video. So this is my point two. Um, there was a couple points that I really wanted you to leave with, and this is, this is the biggest slide on for me. Why spend time recreating 1.0? with substitution and augmentation when we could be really engaging students, ourselves, our colleagues, professional development with 2.0 or 3.0. So a lot of people look at the SAMR as a way to, as stages, and I say that's not because teachers are going to get hung up with substitution and augmentation when we have the tools, the skills, the abilities, kids are coming in chomping for unique ways to use technology because they are, I know, and that's what, and for me, I'm saying that's my radical perspective, Maureen, and I know people disagree with me. I say, forget the baby steps. Let's just go for it. Let, let's go for integrating technology in a way that we could enhance education 2.0 and 3.0. So I understand the logic. I just want people, um, <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right, so here's Maureen had mentioned this earlier, but I want you to look at this because as I was as I was um, as I was preparing this yesterday, and Edudemic is a very popular blog, and this came out yesterday. Just what Max to support? I mean, apps for Max to support the classroom. Go click into that link. I'll put it up here too. Go click into that link and tell me what most of these links are, education 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0. If you go in, you're going to see, oh, this is not right. Why is this not coming up? Oh, there it is. Yeah, look at them. should have the list. I'm just not giving it time. The type is. Memory Master, 50 states and capitals, preschool animal match. But I'll let you see if you could find any example that is education 3.0 or 2.0 or 3.0. So that's your goal. Find one of these apps. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I noticed that too, Marie. If you haven't seen Geo, GeoGebra. Oh, here. I think you might have to link in. I'm scrolling down. It says follow me. PDF reader, it depends. Color by numbers. I just find it interesting. These are the type of apps that my thing is, 
when I look at apps, would a kid use them on their own time? Is that on there? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go through a few of the way I took some content area, and I'll just give you a second to look through them, a minute to look through them. I, I thought about major reading, writing, you'll see um, presentations and how they would fit into the different um, SAMR models. It, the creation apps I do like. Because then you could actually guide them to Education 2.0 or 3.0. So what you've seen here is I look at most substitution and augmentation of the SAMR model to be Education 1.0 and modification to be 2.0 and redefinition to be 3.0. Just have a look through those. And I then say, oh, and how many of you I love Goodreads? Any of you on Goodreads? I, it's one word. Book. Book, even book reading, yeah, even book reading social, I go and see what other people have said in their reviews. I provide reviews. So now even the, the, this individual pursuit of reading has become uh, more social, 2.0, 3.0. Here's how writing, and again, I'm not going to read to you. You could just have a look through it. And then I do, would you rather students doing this or this? And if you look at the one on the right, the whole reason I started this blog was for my advanced comp class, and this post will be the last for that class. I've been thinking about whether I should keep the blog or get rid of it. In the beginning, I was just going to do it for class because I thought I wouldn't want to continue writing with it. But now I found out that I really like blogging. It's like one big diary that everyone can see and comment on. So I think I'm going to keep it, and later on, if I want to stop, I will. But for now, I'm going to keep doing what I want with the blog, and hopefully it will work out. So I don't know what you'd want, but I sure would want my kids. Actually, I do. Um, I actually have a slide for that, Marie. Here's what up. I'm not going to do this now because of time, but I want you to think about it. How could you define your students, redefine your students' writing experiences to have more of a 2.0 or 3.0 flavor? And if you want to put them in the chat, you can. I know we're running low on time, but if you have any ideas you want to put in chat, please do. How you, what's one small step? Again, I said if you're not going to take any actions based on your attendance here today, then, then that was a problem. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Dave. And you could have them tweet, I think, for writing. You have them summarizing. You have them being characters in a book. There's, there's tons. Just Google it. There's a lot of ways that students could tweet. And here's presentations. They tend to be more didactic. And so do you want students just watching? I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, Yep, I actually had a student, Shelfari. He didn't like to read at all, a gifted kid, and Shelfari, it was a social site for books. He read and put comments on, and he started book clubs. It's pretty amazing. 
So would you do you want to get lectured to? And this the one on the right is like popcorn, Mozilla popcorn. But there's ways the kids could do mashups of multimedia with comments, audio links, so that they're they're making the they're mashing up the presentations for themselves. And again, I wanted to know how what's one thing you could do with your students to make it more um, to make giving presentations and videos more education 2.0 or 3.0. Here's one for games, and this one's a big one I call worksheets on steroids. There's so many games that are just worksheets on steroids. The kids get a kick out of them because they're technology in the classroom, but they soon get bored with them. Yeah, you do that. That's really cool, Maureen. So would you want your kids doing the top one or the bottom one, which is a kid who designed a Minecraft classroom within Minecraft? And then I would, I would again have you reflect on how you might use games in your own learning environment to make it more 2.0 or 3.0. Like I said, I'm hoping to get with the gifted kids next year, and they're going to be doing a lot of game making, not a lot of game playing. And then networking, and that's what Maureen, I think, said earlier. And I say Education 1.0, they might use Edmodo, but it's very closed. It's behind wall gardens. Because you want your students experiencing private no entry or having lots of social networks. And then how would you do that in your classroom? All right, so here's some resources just that I have for you. I have blog posts on these. And ask me if you have any questions in this last few minutes. I really appreciate those of you who participated today. But here's the one, the blog that discusses that. And I, like I said, I've done some more. And I hope you get interested. So what's the liability? It's education, sure. Let me know if you have any questions, and I appreciate it. And oh, here's again the uh, slide chair that has all my slides. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I keep all my slide chairs up, Dave. I, I believe one of my things is I believe a responsibility um, of the 21st edu century educator is to share and put their stuff out there. So I love I love doing that. And I'm actually tweeting this the slide share so you can have it out there too. Thanks, Maureen. So again, I'm just hanging out, seeing if you have any questions and. Thank you so much for um, 